turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, as we read our text for this morning, Matthew chapter 5. And it's going to be verse 17. Matthew 5 and verse 17. It says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we ask this morning that you would again would just transform our lives by the, by the preaching of your word. And let the scriptures uh, penetrate into our hearts, Lord. And uh, Father, ex- let, let, them ex- let your spirit just expose need in our heart. And then, O oh God, we ask that you meet it as we glorify you and worship you. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. So, uh, I'll say this right from the very beginning. Um, this is not comprehensive. Uh, to take this subject that we're looking at of the law this morning and try and take all of that and put it into 45 minutes, which I hope it's just that long. I'm only kidding. Um, it's very difficult. Uh, I could preach for three hours on it today, and then Logan can come and he can preach for another three hours, and then I could do another three hours, and Logan come back and do another three hours, and we still would just barely brush the surface on this. So uh, what, I've, what I've tried to do is just give you what we need to know about the text. So this text it really is fraught with endless rabbit holes that we can fall into, all of them holding really magnificent depths of beautiful doctrinal truths and knowledge, as well as hearty discussion of different theological views on that. Augustine said of this text, the New Testament is latent, and that word latent there means present but not visible. So the New Testament is latent in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is patent in the New Testament, patent meaning obvious or evident. The, the Old Testament and the New Testament, they cannot be separated. In fact, A.W. Pink said that he deeply regretted that the New Testament was ever printed without the Old Testament. Why? Because we need the Old Testament and the law within it and every one of its prophetic utterances, for it's in the law we see our sin and our need of righteousness and the prophets point us to the Messiah that can save us from our sin and give us his righteousness both giving the shadows and the types of Christ that is yet to come uh, there has recently and I won't tell you how long but it's, it's been recently uh, been those who have come dangerously close, if not completely heretical in their views on the Old Testament. Uh, I want to read to you some, some quotes from a uh, well-known pastor and what he thinks about the Old Testament. He says, Christianity does not need propping up by the Jewish scriptures. There's one. Peter, James, and Paul elected to unhitch the Christian faith from the Jewish scriptures. And my friend, we must as well. He says, the Ten Commandments have no authority over you. None, to be clear. Thou shalt not obey the Ten Commandments. The Old Testament is great for inspiration, but not application. Don't do anything the Old Testament tells you to do because someone in the Old Testament tells you to do it or because they did it themselves. He says, it is next to impossible to defend the entire Bible. And one last one, crazy one. Perhaps you were taught, as I was taught, that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That is where our trouble began. Do you see any danger in those thoughts? Unhitch the Christian faith from the Jewish scriptures. Thou shalt not obey the Ten Commandments. Don't do anything the Old Testament tells you to do. It is impossible to defend the Bible. 
that's very, very dangerous ground. And maybe this is why the Jews, the chief priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes were concerned about what Jesus was teaching. They, they essentially look at Jesus and say, what say you about the law of Moses? What say you about the prophets? And remember, there is a group, uh, or there's this, there's this gap of time between Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, and verse 12. There, there's a gap, of uh, a gap of time there where more than likely John's gospel covers that little gap there between chapters 2 and chapters 4. So many of these people at that time that may have been hearing that this uh, been present when Jesus was preaching this day were aware of Jesus. That maybe they had heard the things that he was saying and the things he was doing, and, and they're genuinely concerned. And, and we know that they were always trying to confront him on the issues of the law. They thought they would challenge he who was the eternal, infinite wisdom of the ages. He who not only had a greater depth of the knowledge of the law, for he was in fact the author of the law. He called them out, pointed out how many of, how many of their traditions were man-centered and led to self-righteousness and legalism. And you all know when Jesus went contrary to those religious authorities, man, that's when the fireworks began. But they could not find anything wrong with his teaching in, of the law. It was perfect as he was perfect in his life. The bottom line is that with all their supposed great knowledge of the law and the prophets, a light bulb should have clicked on inside their hearts. A bell should have began, uh, started ringing in their ears, telling them that the Messiah was right there before them. But they missed it. They missed it. Jesus will in one paragraph set them straight on the purpose for the law and the prophets they were supposed, supposedly so worried about. They were so worried about all the, the law and the prophets, but yet they didn't recognize who was in front of them. So what do we want to do with this text? Well, very simply, we just ask, what was Jesus saying? What did he mean in our text? Then we ask the question, how do we apply this to our everyday lives? How should this train us in righteousness, uh, reprove us, correct us when, when, we, when needed? Uh, what is so profitable about its teaching and how, how is it equipping us for good works every day? So we're going to look at three, three things this morning. We're going to look at Jesus and the law. We're going to look at Jesus and the prophets. And then we're gonna, last we're going to look very briefly at our relation to both of them. This first point is going to be a, a little bit longer than all the other ones. So first, Jesus and the law. So the first thing we need to set forth at the very beginning is the warning that Jesus gives in regards to the law and the prophets. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish them. That tells us already probably many were having issues with his teaching. Remember, the high regard that they had for Moses and the even higher regard for the law that was brought forth from Sinai's mount. That included all the rabbinical teachings, hundreds of them, I might say, that came afterwards, all those traditions included. So were they really worried about the law or were they more concerned with Jesus upsetting the normal order of establishing, uh, the, 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 norm, the normal order established within the, within the Jewish religion? So what was the law that Jesus said he came not to abolish? Well, first we look at the, the Greek word for abolish. It's a, it's a Greek word called katalusai. It means to utterly destroy, to overthrow, like, we, like it's used in the destruction of the temple. It's used of physical death at times. It has the basic idea to tear down, to smash to the ground, to obliterate. And that's not, and Jesus said, I have not come to do that to the law and to the prophets. I know they had, and really, if we look at it, hindsight's always 20-20, right? They had nothing to worry about. 
They had everything to rejoice about, though. But though they were not the law, technically speaking, the extra scriptural teachings of the rabbis and scribes, those weren't included when Jesus said he came not to abolish the law. Those things weren't there, because those things we'll, we'll get to in, a, in just a minute. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of those, those traditions of the rabbis and the scribes. Things that clouded over and in a way concealed the revealed word of God with their own interpretation. The, these things were purely focused on the externals. Inward obedience could be left out and didn't require true faith in God. No, what Jesus is talking about here is the Jewish scriptures themselves, not the rabbinical ones, not the scribal ones, which were the ones that seemed to cause the most trouble. Now, Matthew doesn't specify how he is using this word law. We would say he intends, to, he intends it to mean the whole of God's law, all of his commandments, all of his statutes, all of his judgments, all the things as contained in the moral, judicial, and ceremonial law. And Logan and I had talked about this, that, that threefold application of law. And I can see it, but I, I, you know, I kind of struggle with it in a way, because really we need to just be concerned with the law as a whole, the whole thing. We don't want to break them up. And this would include old te this, this law that we're talking about, these, these moral, judicial, and ceremonial laws would include uh, teachings that find their basis in the law, and then all of their, all the symbols and pictures and types and patterns that find their fulfillment in Christ in the New Testament. So let's briefly look at this, these three parts to God's laws. First, the moral law. These laws find their basis uh, in God's holy nature. So these laws are holy and unchanging, and they contain regulations on such things as justice, respect, sexual contact, etc., and includes the Ten Commandments, and point to man's fallen and depraved state. Now, one thing I'm going to do, and you can find this afterwards because I'm, I don't want to get hung up here, is I'm going to read to you a little bit from what we have in the London Baptist Confession of 1689. There's some copies in the back, though, that you can pick up because they got scripture references that go with it. Listen to what the London Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter 19, says of the law of God. And this is what we find in paragraph 1 and 2 when it talks about the, the moral law. It says, God gave to Adam a law of universal obedience written in his heart and a particular precept of not eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil by which he bound him and all his posterity to personal entire exact and perpetual obedience promised life upon the fulfilling and threatened death upon the breach of it that endued him with power with the power and ability to keep it that's the moral law that we're talking about there. He goes on, and, and in the second paragraph of that, he says this, The same law that was first written in the heart of man continued to be a perfect rule of righteousness after the fall, and was delivered by God upon Mount Sinai in ten commandments and written in two tablets, the first four containing our duty towards God, and the other six our duty towards man. So that's the moral law. That's what, that's what we're talking about there. Next, we look at what is called the ceremonial law. These dealt with the form of worship among the people of Israel. Think of the sacrifices, the offerings, the ceremonies, the feasts, the festivals, the, the high Sabbath days, circumcision, Passover, uh, redemption of the firstborn. Uh, of the firstborn. And now you're getting the idea what those what those ceremonial laws were. And again, we look back at what the. Uh, <clears throat> And what the confession says, they describe it as this. Besides this law, commonly called moral, God was pleased to give the people of Israel ceremonial laws containing several typical ordinances and part, uh, partly of worship. And we're going to look at this again uh, towards the end. So that is the ceremonial law. Lastly, we look at judicial law or the civil law. Those are those, uh, these are those that were specific for God's people, Israel, and their particular 
particular culture. Remember, they're under God's theocracy at this point. And really, if we pause and we th and we put it in perspective, every one of these, these breakdowns, all three of these uh, spots that we call the law, every one of them was particular to the people of God, to Israel. It separated them from every other nation that was out there. This would include, the, this judicial law would include things like cleanliness, diet, agriculture, dress, uh, and the settlement of disputes. This made, like I said, this made the people of Israel different than the pagan nations that are around them. It was another thing meant to keep them separated unto God. And we see our, the, our confession says, to them also he gave sundry judicial law which expired together with the state of that people, not obliging any by virtue, but now by virtue of that institution, their general equity only being of moral use. So there we get the whole, the, 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 the threefold application of the law. That's it. And that is what Jesus is referring to when he tells the Jews very clearly, do not think that I have come to abolish the law. But he did say something else. He said that he came to fulfill them. Now that must have greatly puzzled them. What does he mean <clears throat> he came to fulfill them? Well, it goes back to this Greek word, plerosai, means to fill up. See, when, I, when me and Logan were talking about it, if he says that I came to fulfill the, the law will fulfill means to me what I've got enough to make me happy I mean come on how many times do we, I, I feel so fulfilled in my marriage well that, what are we really saying well I'm happy in my marriage I'm, I'm so fulfilled at work I, I'm, I'm just happy at work and everything's great but but that doesn't fit it means to fill up it doesn't mean to add to but to complete what is already present so in Jesus fulfilling the law, he wasn't going to add something more or take away anything, but he was going to shed light or clarify what God had originally intended for those laws. <clears throat> so what did that mean as far as the moral, ceremonial, and judicial laws? Well, the short answer is he was able to fulfill them perfectly where no man could. How did he fulfill the, the moral law? Well, Christ, by his perfect righteousness, was able to keep the whole of the, of the moral law, obeying every command and requirement and standard that was put forth in it. We look into Scripture and we say, well, what does Scripture say about that? How does, it, how does Scripture uh, address that? Romans chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Therefore... As one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. He fulfilled the moral law. We look in Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as the propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over the former sins. Again, Christ fulfills the moral law. We see Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Chapter 10 and verse 10 of Hebrews. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ Jesus once for all. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Jesus kept his word. He fulfilled the moral law completely. He and his perfect obedience to the Father came, fulfilled the law, and sacrificed himself for us, completely satisfying the justice of God, reconciling us with the Father, and obtained for us an eternal inheritance. 
in Emmanuel's land as heirs to the kingdom. Praise God for Christ and his faithfulness to keep the whole of the moral law for us. But then there comes the ceremonial law that he fulfilled. And oh, how we can't even begin to fathom how deep and rich the veins of the shadows and the, and, and the types uh, that, that point to Jesus in the law. They're just, they're just, they're, there's an ocean. I mean, you could begin now to feast and drink of, of those things and in a million years not gone more than a hair's breadth into the depth of those oceans of Christ fulfilling those ceremonial laws. Every sacrifice, every feast day, every, circ- uh, every uh, circumcision, every Sabbath, every festival, everything in the tabernacle, everything in the temple, every priest, every incense burning burner oh every bit of it is pointing to Jesus Christ and the fulfillment that they find in him Jesus fulfilling the ceremonial law perfectly Hebrews is, Hebrews just so beautifully paints this picture for us when we look at Hebrews chapter 7 in verses 20 through 27, it says, And it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one, talking about Jesus, this one was made a priest by an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were, were many in number because they were because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Are you seeing it? That that, that type and anti-type? Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those priests, to offer sacrifices daily for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself up. He fulfilled that ceremonial law. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11 and 12. But when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not uh, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not by means of blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Again, there it is. We see it all the way through. All of it seen in that Paschal Lamb, that Passover Lamb. Jesus, without blemish, uh, without a blemish, there on Calvary's cross. And we see in that, that third section of the, the London Baptist Confession, we see how it's described. They say that all the ceremonial law was prefiguring Christ, his graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits, and partly, t- and partly holding forth divers instructions of moral duties, all with cer- which ceremonial laws being appointed only to the time of the Reformation are by Jesus Christ, the true Messiah, and the only lawgiver who is furnished with power from the Father for that end. That was what he came to do. To abolish or to or to fulfill that ceremonial law without abolishing it. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace and might reconcile both both to God and one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And you go, wait a second, wait a second, he said abolish the law. I mean, it's right there, uh, uh, broken down in his flesh, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of of commandments. So is there a contradiction there? No. What's he talking about? That old covenant is separated, it's severed, it's done. 
And we'll pick up on this just in a, in a little bit. But that's not what it's saying. It's not saying he abolished it. He abolished the commands that would have sent us all to hell in the, in the, in the covenant of works. No, we, we stop and we go, just the wonders of it all. We, we have not, uh, have we not been cleansed by Christ? We haven't, been, we haven't been cleansed by some ceremonial blood from goats or bulls or even some grain-fed lamb from Iowa. That's not what we're cleansed from. No, we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world. And then lastly, the judicial law. All things that concern Israel, as far as judicial laws, were fulfilled there at Calvary's cross also. Scripture tells us two different things. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 25, it says... And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. John chapter 19 and verse 15, they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. See, the nation apostatized. They had rejected their Messiah and they crucified him. They killed him. And look at what the result is. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 11 and 12. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We see in Matthew chapter 21, another thing that he says, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. The judicial law, therefore, was, has passed away. Listen to what John MacArthur says uh, about this. <clears throat> MacArthur says this. Uh, where did I put it? Here it is. That judicial law Jesus fulfilled on the cross. His crucifixion marked Israel's ultimate apostasy in the final rejection of her Messiah and the interruption of God's dealing with that people as a nation. And just so, just to make sure you understand what we are saying, we do not hold to what is called replacement theology, okay? Meaning that God is done with Israel. They're gone. They have, they have no place in God's plan. But we, we would say that the church is now spiritual Israel. We see in Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, And you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And in verse 29, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. But God is, and, and, and I can't stress this enough, and I have a lot of people who disagree with me here. God is not done with national Israel. One day he will redeem them and restore their sight so that they can see Christ. He will restore their hearing so they can hear the gospel with their heart. And he will remove the hardness of their heart. We see this in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 and verses 1 through 12. Listen to what it says. Paul says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars. And I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. 
so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace but if it is by grace it is no longer on the basis of works otherwise grace would no longer be grace what then Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking the elect obtained it but the rest were hardened as it is written God gave them a spirit of stupor eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day and David says let their table become a snare and a trap a stumbling block and a retribution for them let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forward so I asked did they stumble in order that they might fall by no means rather through their trespass salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous God's not done with the nation of Israel. Verses 25 and 27. Listen to what he says here. <clears throat> 25 and 27. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish the ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Jesus came to fulfill all of the law. The law of God, and now this is, this is a lot to take in, but it must be sorted out so that we clearly understand what Jesus was telling them. Jesus wasn't coming to destroy things. He was coming to make things right, things that only he could make right. But they refused to see. They shut their eyes. God has been faithful to complete all his word in the Old Testament concerning Christ. Moving on quickly to the second point, Jesus and the prophets. So we have looked at Jesus and the law and his fulfillment of it for our benefit and his glory. Now we look at why Jesus came not to abolish the words of the prophets either. What Jesus is talking about is the Old Testament prophets and their divinely inspired prophetic utterances. And what we see is the prophets declaring the superiority of the law and then interpreting it and giving application for it. Remember the prophets came with the thus says the Lord. So they came with the, the authority from he who sits on heaven's throne. So they, so they come affirming and confirming the law of God. Not once do we ever find anywhere in scripture them contradicting anything from the, word, from the words of the law. When we look through all of the Old Testament prophets' writings, we see that within all of their prophecies, the warnings and the admonitions, that they all point back to God's law in one way or another. Why? Why do they do that? Well, because they knew that the law had one author, and it was God. It was the great I Am, the one and only true God that we see in, Ex in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1. And that the Word of God, the law, does not change because God is unchanging. All the prophets in the Bible, and oh, how they, how they heard from the heart of God, and not just them, but others who would write the Psalms and, and other writers in the, in, the, in, the, in the Old Testament who were led by God and taught the law. Think about what the New Testament tells us about prophecy, about the Word of God. It tells us two things. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All Scripture, that includes the Old Testament, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the, by the Holy Spirit. Now, it is estimated, and I, and I looked hard for this, it's estimated that there are roughly around 1,817 prophecies in the Bible. The Old Testament containing about 1,239 of them. The New Testament about 578. 
and there are at least 324 prophecies within the total number that are about Jesus himself. Some of these numbers can be higher or lower depending on who the scholar is that's doing the research. Here are just a couple statistics on just a couple prophetic events. The entire prophecy concerning Babylon, the, ch the probability of it coming to pass, one in five million, and yet it happened. How about this? The prophecy concerning Tyre. Now, I hope I say this right because I'm not a math genius at all. I can barely count to, to ten. The Tyre prophecy, the probability of it coming to pass, 1 and 7.5 times 10 to the fourth power. That's a lot. You think that's bad? Gaza and Ashkelon, the prophecy against them, the probability, 1 and 1 1.2 times 10 to the fourth power. That, that right there, the prophets were 100% accurate, 100% of the time. And really, do we need to say anything else about, uh, about G why Jesus had not come to abolish the prophets? That is beyond impressive. That is divine. And none of these prophecies has ever been disproved. Not one of them. But how about the prophecies concerning Jesus himself? This will get you going. Jonathan Burness points out for one single man, Jesus, to fulfill just 48 of, the pro 48 of the 324 prophecies about him, only 48 of those 300 prophecies, the probability is 1 in 10 to the 157th power. That's one and then 157 zeros after that. There it is. Boom. You can't deny it. You cannot deny the prophecies about Christ being completely fulfilled in Jesus. And why would the, and we've got to ask the question, why would the religious establishment of Jesus' day care? Why would they care if Jesus held to a proper view and teaching on the prophets? Well, probably because he calls them out. Matthew chapter 23, verse 29. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of righteousness, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. He goes on in Luke chapter 11, verse 47. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, also the wisdom of God says, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. The, re the religious establishment just gave the prophets lip service, really. The people didn't listen to the prophets of their day, and they surely wouldn't listen to Jesus now, the great prophet, the Son of God. And, and Jesus is telling them he had not come to abolish the prophets. He had come to fulfill everything they had said about him. He was saying, here I am. I am your Messiah. I'm the one that your prophets was pointing to. Your scriptures speak about me. Read about me in the scriptures. And why is this, really we go, why is this so important for us? <clears throat> the same reason it was to the two men that met, that, that met Jesus on the road to Emmaus on that resurrection day. Turn over to Luke chapter 24. This is why it's important. Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> and we look at the beginning, and these, these two guys are, are, are walking down the road, and it says in verse 13 of chapter 24, that very day two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. 
while they were talking and discussing Jesus himself drew near and went with him but their eyes were kept from recognizing him and he said to them what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk and they stood and, and they stood still looking sad <coughs> they didn't get it they didn't get it. The prophets were speak, had spoken about this. But then we look down in verse 24. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but, they, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, Oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning, it's right here, our verse is right here. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. They still didn't get it. And that's why it's important for us. The words of the Old Testament prophets to this day should do a couple things. Should remind us God's word is true. God's word is completely and utterly true. You cannot hold to the word of God in any way, shape, and form if you do not think that God's word is inerrant and unfallible. You, ha you have to believe that it is without error, and there could be no error inside of it. Along with this, God is faithful to see his promises through. We see through all through Scripture, God keeping promises to all these people through all these prophetic events. It happened just as he said it was going to. God is faithful to do that. Even the most minute detail of your and my life, it is important to God because he has planned it out in eternity's past, and he will make sure that it comes to pass. And when necessary, God will discipline those whom he loves. We see it through the scripture. There it is. And yes, we need the testimony of the Old Testament prophets desperately. And may we be faithful to believe their words as God has been faithful to us. Last point is this our relation to both of these. So we've looked at what Jesus said and meant in our text. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. We've already uh, looked at the importance of holding on to the old Testament prophets uh, and their writings and we cannot and hear me say this very clearly because you're going to hear this again as the, as the days grow darker we cannot unhitch from the Old Testament we cannot unhitch from the prophets we cannot unhitch from the law we need those pages of Holy Writ to ensure we maintain the whole council of Scripture the real weight of what Jesus uh, 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 of what Jesus says and how it applies to us comes when we ask the question, well, what about the law? That's really what it comes down to. And this is where the disagreements come in. Some may say we are no longer under the law. We are under grace. So we can just take the law and set it aside. We don't ever need that again. Well, you're, you're doing no better than what the guy, the, the, the well-known pastor said at the very beginning. To which I would just caution, okay? I would caution them from taking that too far. There are some really good, solid, biblical teachers who push the envelope on that. And we don't want to any, in any way be close to being what we call an antinomian, saying that we just get rid of the law. We are forever bound to the law because of our sin. It exposes our need and our condition. But we are still called to obedience by that law. We cannot negate the law completely. We can't take the law and say, we're never doing anything with the law again. We cannot negate the law completely because of grace. The law doesn't just go away. The law comes from the authority of God, our creator, who authored it and gave it to us. And Christ in no way dissolves it, but he strengthens it. 
Now, I, now I do pause and I and I say that as the covenant of works goes and its justification or its condemnation, we are not under the law. And, and if you pick up that handout at the back, you'll see scripture references that back all this up. We, we can't leave the law and cling to just grace, nor can we just cling to the law and, and totally ignore grace. It doesn't work like that. The law is good. Paul tells us that. The law is good for the believers. And, he, and it's good in many ways. The law is good. It informs us of all of what God's will is for us and the duty that we have. It points out the many sinful things in this life and the propensity of, their, uh, of our hearts and our, our lives to fall into sin. And it reveals to us the duty to live, to the, the danger that we face as we try to we may try to live contrary to the law it brings us to examine our hearts so that we may come to repentance and humbleness and to hate our sins and oh how we learn to see how we need Christ and his perfect righteousness and how his perfect passive and active obedience to the father brought our salvation the law is a reminder to restrain the corruptions of our flesh by forbidding sin and showing us what sin deserves and what afflictions we may suffer as a result of those sins. Though not even the curse of God's wrath, though we're not under the curse of God's wrath any longer. And oh, how God loves our obedience and promises manifold blessings to us for faithful for our faithfulness to him not because we're keeping that old covenant but because of the Christ who did keep that that covenant who fulfilled the moral law and the judicial law and the ceremonial law this is this is not contrary to the gospel of grace it goes with it and really i ask part of the law of Christ that we see in Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 would not include the very things found in the moral law and the Ten Commandments to be buried deep within it. I say none. Law and grace hold hands in some strange fashion. They hold hands together. It is to Christ in both and to love both and give praise for what God has accomplished in our lives using both for our salvation. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we just thank you for this morning, Lord. Father, I just pray that you take these imperfect words and use them for your glory. But Father, more importantly, I pray that scripture leads us. The words of men are, are, are good. They help bring some clarity. But, Father, our hearts and our minds, we lean on Scripture alone when it comes to all of our doctrines. We lean on the whole counsel of God. And, Father, let that be true of us today. Lead us and guide us, O oh God. Let your Spirit work upon us, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.